Welcome to this video. Welcome to my garage. Welcome to the Baja Bug. I'm gonna do a video here showing the rear A-arm suspension that I just built. I'm gonna give you the bulk steps that I did just so that you have them and you can possibly follow them. Um, but then I'm gonna break down each one when I show you the rear suspension. Setting the track width and the wheelbase, then fabricate the spindle, fabricate the lower control arm, then fabricate the upper link, then fabricate the drive shaft, then determine your travel, compression, and rebound, then determine your shock locations at the top, at the chassis, and at the control arm. And then at that point, you're basically done, but the last step is to fabricate a bump stop for compression and fabricate your limiting strap for full through. Let's go over a couple of different types of suspension just so that we're all on the same page. As far as I'm concerned, for the most part, on a chassis like this, you can have a, uh, a five link or a link suspension. You can have trailing arm, you can have A arm, and you can have H arm. The link is a great system. With the five link, you basically take your five points of movement and you have a link for each one, and that's a really good suspension setup. That kind of benefit that kind of takes the benefits of trailing arm and the benefits of A arm or H arm and collaborates it into one. The reason I didn't go with link was with link, you have to have a connection point in at the chassis, and you have to have a connection point kind of facing forward. And for the kind of travel I was looking to get, I didn't want to have my suspension traveling in a big arc off of this link that was at the front end of the suspension. Then there's A-arm. A-arm suspension is just like it sounds. It's got a lower control arm that's relatively in the shape of an A. Then it has an upper control arm which is also relatively in the shape of an A. It's got two connection points at the chassis and it comes down to one connection point at your spindle. There can be some different flavors of that but for the most part, that's what an A-arm suspension is. Now what mine is, is H-arm suspension. And that is basically exactly what it sounds like. My lower control arm is for the most part in the shape of an H. Not an A, it's an H. What the H-arm suspension does is basically most of the work, I think four points of movement, are all taken care of by the lower control arm. So on an H-arm system, your lower control arm is doing most of the work. And then for the top, you've just got one link. And that one link just controls the tire from going in or out. So it affects your camber. With mine, I had plenty of, I had plenty of room on the lower end for a lower control arm. I didn't have much, much to play with at the top. So with the H-arm setup, you can set up your upper link so it's just like a steering link. You've got uh, right hand threads and left hand threads. So for adjusting your camber, all you gotta do is turn that upper link. It's very clean, it's very simple. Now that we've said that, you know that this is an H-arm suspension. I know that it's H-arm suspension, but for simplicity, from here on out, I'm just gonna call it A-arm suspension. All right, enough with the stable video. Now I guys got, now I've got you guys on the mobile mount why don't you go take your Dramamine? Because this is probably going to get a little bumpy. <laughs> so the first thing I did when I started this project, I took measurements of how far off the chassis the tire was and how far back off the chassis the tire was. This gave me a starting point. What I knew was that I wanted to make it a couple of inches wider. And ironically, you won't hear this very often, I wanted to shorten the wheelbase. I made a wooden jig to hold it up straight. Then I took the tire and the wheel and I put them where I wanted it. I put them where I wanted the wheelbase this way and then I put it where I wanted it for the track width. Once I had the tire sitting where I wanted it, the next thing that I needed to do was to fabricate the spindle. The spindle was the next step because I, would, I, I needed to build the rest of the suspension off of that. Before I did that, I had to determine which type of hubs I was going to use. I looked at a lot of options. What I ended up going with was the micro stubs. 
what I liked about the micro stubs is it would be it would work well with integrating my U-joint drive shaft into the micro stub. And I like the fact that the micro stub is a full floater. So you can actually take the, the stub axle out without having to take the tire off. So once I knew which hubs I was going to go with, the micro stubs, I ordered the micro stubs and then I fabricated that spindle in there. I've got a complete video just about designing and fabricating that spindle. I'll put a link to it here. So if you want detailed information on that, go ahead and watch that. After I had the spindle, next was the lower control arm. Like I said earlier, the lower control arm needed to be strong enough to carry most of the work of the lower suspension. So I needed to set this up so that it was pretty robust. I set it up with templates, figuring out what would work to clearance everything, put these in here, um, worked out the clearance that I needed to clear the drive shaft. I have a whole separate video where I go into detail as to how I made the lower control arm. I'll put a link to that right here. What inevitably ended up setting my wheelbase was at full compression, I had to make this wide enough so that the tire would just barely miss the body here. One thing that I added on this control arm, which you won't see on a lot of other control arms is, what I did so that I would be able to adjust toe in and toe out is on the control arm here, there's a threaded bung right here and there's a heim for this connection. The same thing on the other side. There's a threaded bung right here, and then this is a heim. So what I can do, we're looking straight up and down here. I can thread those bungs in or out to be able to adjust the toe in or the toe out. Next was the upper link. Now here's where the H-arm suspension setup shines, is you don't need an upper control arm. All you need is this link. The lower control arm, is, is handling most of the work. All you need this arm to do is to keep your hub from going in or out. So all this controls is camber. I was able to make this one just like a steering link. It's got a right hand thread on this end. It's got a left hand thread on that end. So in order to adjust this, all you need to do is loosen these jam nuts and rotate it and it'll get longer or shorter. This is made out of inch and a quarter 095 DOM. It needs to be pretty, pretty solid. So in order to set mine up so that as the suspension goes up and down, the camber stays the same, I needed to match the geometry of this upper link to the geometry of the lower control arm. Basically what that means is the pivot points, the distance from this pivot point to this pivot point is exactly the same as the pivot point on the lower control arm on the outboard side and on the inboard side. And then this upper link is parallel to the lower control arm. So the same distance, same length. So what that means is because these travel together, this, this spindle stays straight up and down or whatever angle you set it to. So after I had the lower control arm and the upper link in place, the next thing I had to do was fabricate my drive shaft because I needed that in order to determine my travel. This drive shaft is actually out of a late 90s uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Wrangler. And then on this end, there's an adapter here that I bought that'll take this U-joint to the, uh, and it'll bolt to a Volkswagen Type 2 transaxle. So I had to cut all this, I had to cut all this apart, weld in this piece, and I also, did a bunch of welding onto the micro stub, but like most of these other components, I've got a completely separate video. I'll put a link to it right here where I go over specifically the fabrication of the drive shaft. Once I had the drive shaft in place, I was able to determine travel because I needed the, the drive shaft to tell me how far down my droop could go because it's basically limited by when the U-joints max out. And then for compression, that was basically limited 
by my ground clearance in the center there. So what I did is I mocked everything up so that the center of the chassis was three inches off the ground at full compression. And that's what I used to determine how far up this could go. Now, when I went to the A-arm suspension, the location of these shocks completely changed. In the step before, I had determined my full compression and my full droop. So once I could simulate that, I could start calculating where these shock absorbers could go. And for the most part, that just ended up being a whole bunch of trial and error. The first thing that I did was I put the suspension at full compression. I put the shock absorber on here. The springs were off. I had it fully compressed and I set it up so that it was 90 degrees off of the control arm. That would be a good starting point for my maximum compression. From there, I was able to start figuring out roughly where the shock would connect up at the top of the chassis here. But at that point, I had a bunch of jigs in here so that I could adjust the shock absorber in and out and up and down as I was trying to determine where my final mounting location was gonna be. I also had a temporary shock mount down on the bottom here and then I could clamp it right here because both of these are, are straight. And then I could adjust that in and out. As you change the location down here, it changes the location up there. And so every time you do this, you have to cycle the suspension up and down and you have to make sure that you have enough travel left on your shock absorber so at full droop, it's not maxed out, and at full compression, it's not maxed out. So as this suspension goes from full compression to full droop, it never maxes out this shock absorber. This is a 14 inch shock absorber. It's probably utilizing a little bit more than 12 inches of the travel. This fuel cell used to be number one, two inches higher, and it also used to be it didn't have this notch. It just went, it was, a, it was a rectangle. But remember, these shock absorbers weren't here before. They were going forward. So I had to notch this out so that these shock absorbers would clear. I also have a separate video for the modifications that I made to this fuel cell. If you want to take a look at that, because it goes into detail as to how I did all that, I'll throw a link to that right here. Now what I've got for limiting travel is I've got a, uh, a limiting strap to limit the droop. I've got a tab welded onto the lower control arm here. I've got the strap. This is an 18 inch strap. What I've done here for now is I've got a, this piece of metal bolts to the strap, then this piece of metal bolts to the chassis. If I need to make some changes in the length, I can remake this with the, uh, I can remake it shorter. And then for the, for the bump stop, I've got this piece. It actually is bolted onto, this is where the bump stop was for the trailing arm. The, trailing, the bump stop was like right here. The trailing arm would come up and hit it right there. What I did for this is I made, I made this piece that bolts on here. I've got the bump stop right here. This is a sliding collar, so I can actually unbolt it here, drill a new hole if I need to change the elevation of this. And I think what's gonna happen is at some point in time, I'm gonna actually upgrade this to a pneumatic bump stop. And when I do that, I'll actually have the top of this tied into the chassis. So that's the bulk of the rear suspension. Let me give you some details on uh, the shock absorbers. These are Fox shocks, they are uh, two inch. They're emulsion. I wouldn't recommend you go emulsion. I would recommend you go with the reservoirs. That's a that's a much better shock absorber. Um, these are 14 inch travel. Like I told you before, I'm utilizing around 12 inches of it, but it, it is a 14 inch travel shock. The springs on here right now, this top spring is a 250 pound spring. It's 14 inches long. The lower spring is a 300 pound spring and it's also 14 inches long. So in a nutshell guys, that is it. There are a couple things that I would have done differently though. Um, number one being, I told you earlier, this lower control arm is an inch and a quarter thick. That, I, I feel like that's maybe a little bit on the thin side and I kind of wish that maybe I would have gone like an inch and a half. 
I've got all of this support here for the shock absorber, and I really like that. I'm really happy with that. Then for some reason, on the other side of the control arm here, where the bump stop hits, I didn't add any extra support. Again, if I had it to do again, I would add some bulk over here so that if the bump stop actually hits that control arm pretty hard, there's more metal there uh, to support it. Another thing that I would have done differently is, you know, I put a lot of effort in getting the pivot points on this end and the pivot points on that end close to the U-joints. And I actually got it pretty close. But another thing I was trying to do, especially on the spindle end, is just get the pivot points as close inside to the center of the wheel as possible. Well, when I did that, I kind of didn't realize that if the pivot point is right here on the spindle, well, no matter what, the U-joint's not going to be as far in. So I could have actually moved this pivot point, let's say, out another inch on the spindle. Um, and that would have made the, the slip yoke on the drive shaft go in and out even less. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you liked it. If you have any questions about this rear suspension, put it in the comments. I really try and answer all questions that people ask me on these. If somebody wants to do this on their bug, I want to help them. I want to be able to give you some tips so that you can do it um, and hopefully I can avoid some of the problems that I ran into that you might run into and make it an easier build for you. So thanks for watching the video guys. Subscribe please if you're not a subscriber to my channel. I try to make videos related to off-roading or this bug or to just tinkering with things. Um, so hopefully I'll see you on the next video. Take care.